In this video, we'll be discussing pneumonia by going over five different questions. I will read the question for those listening, pause to give you a second to access your brain and what you remember, read the four options, and then we will discuss. This is just a surfaced overview of pneumonia. If you need more in-depth information, you can refer back to your nursing resources under the categories respiratory and or infection. We're also going to review a little bit of pharmacology. There'll be some questions on amoxicillin and super infection. There's also going to be a lot of select all that apply in this group. So if you want to practice that, definitely watch this video. But before we start, I do want to just have you refer to the picture and remind you what exactly pneumonia is. Pneumonia is fluid filled areas in the lungs, usually the base, the bases. So this picture is a little bit off unless it's just trying to show us what the lung looks like, but that picture should really be coming from the base of the lungs because that's where pneumonia settles. And pneumonia is just simply defined as infiltration of the lungs or inflammation of the lungs. And the key is to know what's causing it. It could be caused by bacteria, virus, fungus, parasite, um, food in the lungs. So in the diagnostic process, it's always important to figure out what pathogen has caused this as well as to treat the symptoms of the lung irritation. And this video is a little bit longer because we do pause in two questions and review in depth the signs and symptoms of pneumonia on one and then the interventions on another. So let's get started. Question number one. A patient is admitted with shortness of breath, also called dyspnea. The patient is using accessory muscles to breathe and her oxygen saturation is 89% on room air. What other signs and symptoms which suggest pneumonia? Select all that apply. So take a minute and think. There are a lot. Do you, what do you think of number one? Bronchial sounds in the periphery of the lung. Number two, dullness on percussion. Number three, hyperresonance on percussion. Number four, a white blood cell count of 13,000. And because this is select all that apply, we're going to go through the true false method. Number one is true. When there's bronchial sounds and the bases, which is the periphery of the lung, that is not good. That, those should be vesicular sounds. Bronchial sounds only belong over the throat area, which is the main bronchus. So when we hear those sounds in the bases, that's an indication of consolidation. Number two is true. The lungs should be um, sounding as a resonance when when you percuss, and that's when you put your two fingers over their lung and you hit your fingers. But if you hear dullness, that means again that you're percussing over something solid and we shouldn't have solid areas in the lungs. So that's an indication again of consolidation that something solid's down there. Number three is false. Hyperresonance on percussion is usually found with overinflated lungs, like maybe in a COPD case. And then number four, a white blood cell count of 13,000. Anything over 10,000 indicates the immune system is active, whether it's inflammation or infection. So that one is true. We're gonna take a minute here, because you can see there was a lot of space left on this slide, and we are gonna take a minute to review all the signs and symptoms that somebody can present with when they have pneumonia. So they could have local respiratory symptoms, like the cough, it could be productive, it could be um, purulent, meaning there it's like kind of a yellowish green color. When you listen to them and you auscultate, you could hear crackles, also known as rails. It could be worse to like a ronchi sound. They could be complaining of chest pain when they breathe in because it hurts to try to breathe through all that um, consolidated area, and we call that pleuritic chest pain. They could have increased respirations, known as tachypnea. So that would be any respirations over 20. In the bases of the lungs on the x-ray, normally it should be more like a, a black color there, but in pneumonia, you're gonna see that in the bases, there's a white area, and then that the white area indicates that that's solid substance, so consolidation there. We already said dullness on percussion. Bronchial or even the decreased breath sounds, if it's really bad, the, they, you might not hear any air movement in there. The body itself 
could show signs of the inflammation and or infection in um, it would have a the body could have a fever malaise which is more like a fatigue chills uh, tachycardia heart rate over 100 increased white blood cell count we already said that and then there's some other signs some quick assessments that you can do that might indicate that you're there's some consolidation in the lungs and what the nurses could do tactile fremitus and that's when we put our hands on their lungs and we ask them to say the number 99 and over the areas of consolidation you'll really feel that vibration louder when they say that number we could also test for egophony and that's when we're listening to them with their with our stethoscopes and over each area we ask them to say the letter e and it will sound like a when it's over the consolidated areas where the pneumonia possibly is we could also ask them if they have increased orthopnea, but actually we really couldn't use that word because they would have no idea what we're talking about. And so in order to assess for orthopnea, you wanna ask them how many pillows they sleep on at night. And if they tell you three, for example, you would document that as orthopnea times three. If they get sent for pulmonary function tests, you might expect a decreased forced expiratory volume, FEV, because maybe it's a little bit more difficult for them to exhale, or maybe they have increased residual lung, meaning they can't exhale all the air out, and so the RV would increase. And usually those are more significant in older adults. In the labs, besides the white blood cell count, we might see an increased C-reactive protein and uh, sedim sediment rate, that's call also called the ESR, those are both elevated when the immune system is active. So not, not exactly specific diagnosis, but when those are up, you know the immune system's doing something. And if it's really bad, you could have a possible respiratory acidosis if uh, CO2 is being blocked and they can't exhale very well. So if you had a hard time with that question, again, the answers were one, two, and four. It's a great idea to review the pneumonia signs and symptoms. I mean, please take a screenshot of this if you need to, to review it, listen to it again. And one other thing before we move on is just remember the presentation in older adults is a little bit different. They may not have a lot of the signs and symptoms I just mentioned, and that's because older adults have older immune systems. And when your immune system is not able to respond you might not get that fever. You might not get that cough because that's all an immune response. And therefore in an older adult, when they get pneumonia or, or any infection, they usually present with a mental status change. They might fall. So if you see that in your older adult, that mental status change, that kind of, you even might describe it as, I just feel off. Go looking for a sign of infection. Maybe, maybe it is a pneumonia. Maybe it's a UTI. But just know in older adults, you're really not gonna have the same presentation cannot depend on a fever in an older adult to show you any any kind of infection number two the client gets a pneumonia after being in the hospital for three days the nurse knows the patient was infected by a pathogen in the hospital which type of pneumonia would the nurse expect the patient to be diagnosed with is the answer number one streptococcus pneumonia number two Pseudomonas pneumonia, number three, pneumocystis carni pneumonia, or number four, pneumococcal pneumonia? The answer here is number two. This question really wanted to make you remember the differences in pneumonias. And in this one, if the patient did not get sick until day three, we have to subtract two days to consider that that's when he was infected because you remember from our infection infection lecture that it takes like two days in that incubation period for somebody to then become symptomatic so that means he was actually infected on day one when he was already in the hospital because this is now day three so the thought was that the hospital acquired pneumonia is responsible if the patient becomes symptomatic more than 48 hours after admission because we have to think about it took two days for that incubation period and therefore that's how the nurse knew that the client was infected in the hospital and the problem with that is that the bacteria that is spreading and around in the hospital are usually the resistant ones and therefore are the most dangerous and the most difficult to treat 
If you had a hard time with this question, it's a great idea to review the different types of pneumonia. HAP, CAP, HCAP, opportunistic ventilator associated, aspiration pneumonia, and viral pneumonia. So we just said what HAP is, some other examples of pathogens that live in the hospital that people get infected with besides the pseudomonas, um, aspergillus, uh, all your resistant bugs, your MRSAs, uh, kilobasa, that I have a hard time saying that one, and the community associated pneumonias, CAP, are the ones that we just kind of hear commonly. You might hear your friends say, oh, I got diagnosed with a walking pneumonia or something like that. You know, those are usually from bac bacteria that we see in the community like strep or pneumococcal. HCAP is an interesting one. That stands for healthcare associated pneumonia. So in this one, the patient got infected with a bad bacteria because it is associated with the healthcare um, personnel or facility, but they just weren't in the hospital. So just think of other places where people come into contact with either healthcare personnel or it's a healthcare facility. So maybe a home health nurse came to their site, came to their home and they got sick afterwards, or maybe they were at like an infusion center or a, a rehab center. That would be an example of HCAP. Opportunistic, the example in the options, that one is PCP pneumonia. Opportunistic pneumonia is pathogens that are usually very weak pathogens, meaning they're out there, but they're so weak that our bodies fight them off very easily and they don't infect us. So those bacteria are really only going to infect people with that are immunocompromised, like maybe your HIV patients, your AIDS patients. And that's why we call them opportunistic because they finally have the opportunity to infect somebody. Now, when I say they're weaker, easier to treat, it might not be easier to treat in the person that's already immunocompromised, but they're the ones that will get those. Ventilator associated is that bacteria that climbs down that endotracheal tube of somebody that's ventilated and then lodges in the lungs. So that's why we're very careful when people are ventilated to wash our hands, maintain sterile technique, because there is that tube, that endotracheal tube, or the tracheal tube itself, is direct access right into those lungs for a bacteria to climb down. Aspiration pneumonia happens when somebody accidentally aspirates, meaning something gets into lungs like food or something, and then it starts to grow a bacteria or cause inflammation, that's aspiration pneumonia. And then of course we have our viral pneumonias. Those are probably going around a lot considering I'm recording this during the winter. We've got a lot of flu going on, COVID, uh, RSV, and any of those can also decide to kind of lodge and infect in the lungs and cause a pneumonia as well. So hopefully that helps you review your different types of pneumonias. Again, it's important to know what pathogen is causing this so that the doctor can tailor the treatment to what it is, whether it's bacterial or viral. A four-year-old is admitted with complaints of shortness of breath and an oxygen saturation of 90%. Based on the x-ray, the client is diagnosed with pneumonia. The doctor has ordered the patient to start a broad spectrum antibiotic, amoxicillin, which is common to treat children with pneumonia. What does the nurse need to ensure before starting the medication? Select all that apply. Is it number one, check the patient for allergy to penicillin. Number two, assess the patient's kidney function. Number three, make sure the sputum specimen for culture was sent. Number four, recheck the oxygen saturation level. Since this is a select all that apply, we're going to go true false. Number one is true. You have to remember that amoxicillin falls under the category of penicillin, and therefore it's important to check for an allergy. Number two is false. Uh, penicillins don't typically affect kidney function. You might have been thinking about aminoglycosides, genomycin or vancomycin if you selected number two. Number three is true. It's very important before we ever start antibiotics, it really doesn't matter what infection it is, even UTIs, that you have to send the specimen for culture. So in this case, it's the sputum specimen because if you start antibiotics before you send off that sputum specimen, the culture results could be skewed. Number four is false. 
um, there's no reason here to recheck the oxygen level plus on tests we usually don't redo the assessment data that's already given and the question asked about what do we need to do before starting the medication so make sure you're really looking at the question to um, think of your answers so if you had a hard time with this question, make sure to review what your duties are before administering antibiotics. Question number four. The client is admitted with pneumonia. The nurse would expect to implement which of the following interventions? Select all that apply. Would you, number one, have the patient sit high fallers? Number two. Encourage the patient to use the incentive spirometer once a day. Number three, increase the patient's fluids to help liquefy his secretions. Number four, apply oxygen two liters nasal cannula as needed. And again, this is a select all that apply. So we're gonna go through true false. Number one is true. It is best to have them sitting um, high fallers, definitely upright, it helps them expand their diaphragm and get the most breath. Number two is false. Be careful here. We do want the client to use the incentive spirometer, but it's not once a day. Remember, you can't pick an answer that is part false. That once a day makes it false. Incentive spirometry should be done every hour while awake. Number three is true. We definitely want to encourage him to drink fluids. It'll help to liquefy his secretions, then it's easier for him to cough those up. And then number four, is true. We can apply two liters nasal uh, cannula, some oxygen as needed. So one, three, and four are true. And again, there's a big space here. You might want to take a screenshot of this one. Uh, we're going to go over all the interventions for pneumonia. There's a lot. And so some of the other ones are to make sure that when you are giving us oxygen that you humidify that because oxygen is very drying and it could cause more secretions if you don't humidify that, especially anything over six liters. Try to keep the oxygen on the cooler side. That helps decrease any inflammation in there. I already said sitting upright. Uh, chest PT is when you cup your hands and kind of, you know, just cup, smack their back a bit with your cupped hands and it helps them cough things up. I already said to increase fluids. Remember, normal fluids is two liters, so you wanna to try to increase, at least I'm gonna do two liters, if not more. Uh, cough suppressants, like dextromethorpin. Expectorants, like guafenicin, are great for them. The incentive spirometry, usually do it 10 times every hour while awake. Same thing with coughing and deep breathing. Turning them every two hours, it helps change where the drainage is. Bronchodilators like albuterol, epitropium, definitely get them up and get them moving around. If they can't walk around, at least get them up out of bed every shift, if it's okay with the doctor, of course. Antibiotics, if bacterial, um, pain control, because remember they can have pleuritic chest pain. Just be careful if you're giving them an opioid because that can cause some respiratory depression. Uh, Tylenol, acetaminophen is also great for pain and great for fever. Just a quick note, make sure you don't give them any more than four grams a day because then there could be issues with the liver. So that's a quick review there. There's a little picture of an incentive spirometry in the corner with a guy using it too. And so if you need to review those, please do. Last question, number five. A patient is receiving antibiotic ther therapy for pneumonia. She needs two weeks of IV antibiotics. The nurse knows the patient is at risk for the following condition due to the antibiotic therapy. So what comes to your mind that could happen when somebody's on antibiotics? Is it number one, hallucinations, number two, resistance, number three, super infection, number four, recurrent infection? And the answer here is number three. The thought was to think about when somebody's on IV antibiotics, it's a few weeks, normal flora in the body, so like normal bacteria yeast that we just have that doesn't cause us problems, but that can tend to overgrow and cause things like yeast infections or if you're familiar with C. diff, colostrum difficile, which causes diarrhea. And so we're gonna keep an eye out for that. And so the answer is number three. And if you need to review your super infections, what to look out for when somebody's on antibiotics, then good idea to look at how you would treat them as well.
Well, that's it. Hope you enjoyed this content on pneumonia. It was a little bit longer because there was a lot of signs and symptoms associated with pneumonia and interventions. But if you like this content, subscribe to our channel for more and find us at signstrategies.com.